Hey, Stacy David here, and this is the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals since 1919. That's right, over 100 years building tools and still going strong. If you need tools, check them out. You won't be disappointed. All right, let's get rolling. You know, we were talking in the shop the other day about, uh, you know, how we all get started and stuff like that. And it's a question that comes up a lot. You know, when I'm out at events and stuff, people are like, how did you get into the TV show? And how did you get into cars? And, you know, I understand that you're a musician and how did all that happen? And that's, that's quite a story. So we'll try to talk through that a little bit and uh, see if maybe there's something that you can relate to with this. You know, when I was growing up, there was two things I was really passionate about, and it was music and cars. And this is ever since I was a little kid. You know, I was always enamored with cars and and music and guitars, especially. So when I was growing up, you know, I was Hot Wheels. I was model cars. You know, it was everything. It's all I could talk about. And it wasn't just cars. I liked trucks and I liked bulldozers and I like earth moving equipment and anything that had a motor was just intriguing to me. I remember mom had this old mixer that you held by hand. It had those things that, you know, the mixers that spun. And I thought that was so intriguing how they intertwined. And I remember, you know, figuring out how that thing worked. And I found how cool it looked if you took a piece of cloth or something and stuck it down in there. And so I always had mom's mixer wound up in the couch or in a blanket or something. And she would come in and it was, she was like, how does this mixer keep ending up, you know, wound up into stuff? And uh, it was me doing it. <laughs> so I couldn't wait to get that, that first car and to dig into that. My dad wasn't really a car guy. I mean, he likes cars. But as far as like turning wrenches on him, he's not into that at all. But boy, I was. So from then on, it was like I was a lost cause. I couldn't get away from it. I was, I was bound to turn wrenches on something. One of the, the interesting things is the path, my musical path, was very similar to my automotive path. Anybody can relate to that. Anything that you're passionate about will kind of follow this path. The first guitar that I ever had was a Yamaha acoustic. You know, it was one of those little learning guitars. And my parents still have it. And it is beat up, but I still, when I go out to the house, I have to pick it up and play it a little bit. And then dad got me first electric guitar, and it was a Harmony Rocket. And it had three pickups on it, big hollow body thing. And it had all these white buttons around it. And see, and I wanted it because it had all these great buttons. I didn't know what they did, but it sounded cool, I thought. That was my electric guitar until I got a Gibson SG. And my uncle had that, and he sold it to my dad for cheap. That became my first good electric guitar. But the thing is, my musical tastes were a lot different than my dad. Dad was a real traditional country guy, and he liked, you know, kind of the crooners, you know, like the the Jim Reeveses and the, you know, the Elvises and things like that. And that was great, but I just, yeah, I didn't really like country music that much because... I discovered CCR and Chuck Berry and stuff when I was in grade school. And I remember I was riding on the school bus and this cat food commercial comes on. And this is how vividly I remember this. It was a commercial for cat food and it had the introduction of Johnny B. Good. It was somebody, you know, copping the riff off of Johnny B. Good. I had never heard anything like that. I mean, I was like, I skipped school that day. First time I ever skipped school because I was like, what was it? I had to get home trying to figure out what that was. And I had no clue, but it just rang in my head. I'm like, what was that? And so I started trying to research it and I started listening to stuff and then I discovered Chuck Berry. I was never the same from then on. I mean, that was that was it. And that opened me up to the the world of blues and you know, all of that early rock and roll stuff. And it was really funny because this was about the time there was a whole resurgence of that kind of coming along. The Stray Cats, you know, the Queen had their crazy little thing called Love. Everybody was doing kind of that kind of retro rock and roll thing. The Cars were coming out. Uh, Tom Petty. I mean, everybody kind of had a little bit of that going on. And, oh, I love that stuff. Of course, now, Dad, he didn't like that. So 
was there was a little bit of uh, uh, struggles there, shall we say? And it was the same thing with cars. See, Dad was a he had been a cop for all these years, so he, he chased these hot rodders down all the time, and he didn't realize that like the the worst hot rodder of all time was right under his own roof, and he didn't even know it. So, you know, I was out there, you know, just loving that automotive lifestyle and the, and the hot rodding and all that other stuff and hanging out with, you know, guys that they had arrested uh, and not even knowing that until later. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun time. But I, I say that to kind of tell people, it's like, listen, everybody kind of has to choose their own way. And everybody is gifted in a different way. As much as I see people try to tell others like, well, this is what you should do. Nobody can really do that for you. So, you know, I kept moving forward with that. Out of high school, I went to one year of college and then dropped out of college because that wasn't for me and, you know, headed back to Nashville. And I had a 65 Mustang Fastback and two guitars, an amplifier and a suitcase. And that's pretty much it. And no friends, you know. So those uh, early years in Nashville were, you know, they were tough. But, you know, I learned a lot through that. And it was one of those things, though, where, you know, I couldn't get around the car stuff either. Even when I was in the music industry, you know, I found people that were also in the car world. And so they kind of went together. I was always doing stuff with cars. And that's where my first shop came from. You know, the rattle trap. I, I opened my own shop because so many people were asking me to build cars for them. And it just was a natural thing to do. I spent many times in the recording studio with beat up bloody knuckles, you know, sitting there trying to uh, <laughs> trying to not cause myself pain or not bleed all over my guitar because I'd cut a finger doing something on a car. But I say that to encourage you guys to get out there and follow what you, you know, your passion and, and what you're good at. You know, like I said, follow your own path. <laughs> You know, when gearheads get together, it isn't long until the subject of tools comes up. Because tools are what make all this possible. You guys know that. And car guys and girls are passionate about tools. What's good and what is bad. And that is one thing that I have to give Cornwell a lot of credit for. They'll listen to what the pros are saying about their tools and constantly make changes to build them better. That's why they have new screwdriver handles and ratchets and all kinds of other stuff coming out all the time. It's not just to get your money, which a lot of people think. It's the never-ending quest to build a better tool. Because Cornwall knows that if you're not working and getting paid, they're not getting paid. <laughs> That's why they're America's oldest tool company and still going strong. Check them out. So a lot of people are asking, you know, the like the path, you know, how, do, how did you end up on trucks? You know, or I, I, what did you do in town or what bands did you play with and all that other kind of stuff? And it's a really kind of a long story, but it's it's very interesting. You know, when I when I came back, you know, I was a hired gun. I would play for anything because I wanted to be a professional musician, you know, which means if you're a professional musician, you get paid for it. Which is the challenge. You don't want to be playing for free because then you're just an amateur. So first of all, you know, I was always working to increase my skill level in everything. And I am to this day. I'm a very strong believer the day you quit learning is the day you die. Because, you know, you, you, there's always something else you can learn. There's always another approach. And that, that has to do with music. It has to do with cars. It has to do with anything like that. So you have to keep yourself fresh and you have to keep yourself growing all the time. I was on the road for several uh, years, you know, living out of a suitcase. You know, I was playing, you know, in the, in the Christian music world and in the secular music world, you know, taking jobs wherever. So one day I would do a, a bluegrass gig and the next day I'd do a rock gig, <laughs> you know, and then you'd do a session somewhere and the session would pay you $700 an hour. And then you do one the next day, you get a hundred bucks for four hours, you know, you just kind of take them all. But I ended up playing at Opryland for a long time at the theme park. And uh, I played guitar and sang there. And I did that for 10 years. And it was a really good in-town gig because that would allow you to not only play during the day, but then you had time at night to do sessions or do other gigs. Or you could get subs. You could go out on the road and do a a week or two, which kind of kept that going as well. Because you always had to keep things moving. At the same time, I was also building cars and, and getting that kind of thing going. Probably like mid-90s, you know, I, I noticed that 
there was really no car shows on TV. And I got this idea. It was like, man, it would be really cool to do some sort of a car show on TV. And so I approached the Nashville Network at the time, and it was about 95 or 96, and I still have the letter and uh, back and forth. And I pitched him a show called The Inside Scoop, which is basically kind of what Gears is. They came back and they said, oh, this is great. We love it. It's a great idea. You know, we want to see a pilot. <laughs> and I'm like, pilot? What the heck's a pilot? He flies the airplane, man. I don't know what a pilot is. So I was like, okay. So I talked to somebody and they're like, well, you're, you're basically what you need is a sizzle reel and you need to put something together. And so I started learning about the television process. All the time I'm building cars in the garage and I'm, you know, working these gigs and all this other stuff. So now a couple of years go by and I can't get this out of my head. And I start to see some of these automotive shows come out on the air. And ironically enough, Dennis Gage's show comes out. And when it first comes out, I'm like, who's this Dennis Gage guy? This guy stole my idea. I hate his guts. And of course he didn't. Dennis has become one of my best friends in the industry. He's a great guy. I realized it's like, oh, there's other people that have a similar idea. So if I'm going to do something, I probably need to try to do something. Well, and it was frustrating to me because I didn't know how to do it. Uh, you know, I didn't have the money. I didn't have the, the connections and all that stuff to try to make it happen. But I kept moving forward. And this is the, the whole point of this that I tell people. It's like one of the things that I've always been really adamant about is wherever you are, do the best you can and be the best you can where you are, because that's when the opportunities will come up. If you just sit around and hack, nobody's going to want to give you a promotion or ask you to do something else. You know, you want to learn the skills, you know, that you, that you can while you're there instead of griping and complaining that you're not where you think you should be. And the music business is full of those kind of people that are griping and complaining that they're not you know, th that they don't have a record deal. So anyway, I kept moving forward with that. And finally, I was doing a, an acapella thing at Opryland. And one of the guys in the group, he comes up to me, and I had told him that I wanted to do this car show deal. And so he comes up to me one day, and he goes, hey, did you see Sunday's paper? And I'm like, no. And he said, yeah, there was an ad. They're looking for a host for this truck show. And so I'm like, Really? So he sends me the number. I call the number up. It was the start of trucks. So I go in there, and fortunately, you know, as a musician at the time, both my wife and I, we had done a ton of commercials, a ton of music videos. I was talking with my daughters about some of the stuff. So I pulled up this Wrangler Jean commercial that I was in. I, I showed them the commercial, and they're looking at it. And it was back when Garth Brooks was just out, and it's basically watching this guy's butt walking around because it's all about Wrangler Jeans. And I show them the commercial, and they're like, Dad, where were you? We didn't see you. And it's like, well, I was in the band that was on the stage, and we all ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> and that was it. we still got paid for it, but that's just how it went. Matter of fact, a funny story. When I went in to audition for that commercial, uh, and as a musician, you know, you, you try to take any money that you can get. I walk in there, and I was not a Wrangler jeans guy. I was a Levi's guy, and there is a difference. <laughs> and so I walk in and there's a bunch of guys sitting at a table and they're all from New York, you know, and they're like, hey, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm here for the audition. They said, what kind of jeans are you wearing? <laughs> I'm wearing Levi's. What do you think I'm wearing? They're like, well, you got to get Wranglers. And I was like, I won't wear Wranglers unless you give me the job. So anyway, they look at me and they say, well, turn around. Let's see your butt. This, seriously, a bunch of guys sitting at a table. So I told them, I said, you know, that's a little unnerving for a bunch of guys from New York to ask me to turn around and see my butt. And they just died laughing, man. It probably is what got me the job. <laughs> you know, you couldn't make a living on that kind of stuff. But what that did, unbeknownst to me, is it was giving me a lot of experience working with television crews. And, you know, and I was always watching, you know, how they were doing stuff and the way that the productions were run and all that stuff. So I had a lot of on-camera experience and, you know, on-set experience before I even went into the trucks thing. And that became important because one of the first things they asked me is, what is your on-camera experience? And I was able to show them a couple of commercials I'd done where it actually had speaking parts and that kind of thing. 
And, you know, so that was really important. And I didn't even realize that I was being prepped for that. I just happened to have it. And then they were like, what is your mechanical experience? And I had a whole portfolio of all of these vehicles that I had built. I had pictures of before and after. And I pulled up in an old 70s Jeep pickup truck that was lifted with big tires on it. And they looked out in the parking lot and they said, gee, this is, this is the dude, man. This is... <laughs> now, the crazy thing was, at that time, it was TNN. It was, had, it was huge. It was a huge network. And so the viewership was massive on it. You know, I was up against a lot of professional actors that came in and were like, well, Johnny, you know, the small block Chevy is the, you know, and they're reading scripts. And, but they didn't have any experience turning wrenches. And fortunately, the guys at the time that were uh, putting together the truck show, they said, you know, we, we don't want the typical, you know, two guys talking type show. We want a real hands-on how-to show. And I told them at the time, I said, listen, I don't watch these kind of shows because they're, they're fake. You know, you can tell the guys have never turned a wrench before. You can tell, by the way, a guy holds a wrench. And I said, if I do this, it has to be real. I'm not going to fake the work. No one's going to come in and do it for me. That, that's my background. And they're like, that's exactly what we want. So that's how it went. I was really fortunate that they gave me that freedom early on because then, you know, we were able to establish, you know, what trucks was to become, you know, and a lot of people are like, man, that was such a lucky deal. Yeah, you can look at it that way, but it's not. It's preparation. And like I said, I had an old football coach that used to write on a chalkboard before every game, there is no such thing as luck. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And we're all sitting there going, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, we're in high school. We didn't care. But I always remembered that. And that's true. If you're not prepared for the opportunity, it'll pass you by. Somebody else that is more prepared is going to get that opportunity. And the cool thing was, for 20-some years, I had been a professional musician and it had done really well. You know, I'd been on the Grand Ole Opry a couple of times. And I was right at the point of talking to record labels about a record deal. But I was ready to do something else. You know, I had seen enough in the music industry. Still love music. Still love playing it. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to go that route. I just don't want to do that. So I went the automotive route. <laughs> and I've never regretted it. That's for sure. Okay, this next question comes from Joshua. Joshua has a 56 GMC, two and a half ton truck, 10,000 original miles, and an original straight six. And he says he's looking for some ideas for the bed and the restoration. And that's all he gives me. Well, Joshua, you don't tell me what kind of shape the truck's in. If it's in good shape, man, I'd drive it just like it is. If you have enough power out of that straight six, you know, those trucks, that's probably a grain truck, so it probably doesn't go real fast. But uh, you can always swap out the engine and, you know, do some things like that. But if you go that route, if you start swapping engines, you need to get different axles. And then you need different steering and you need different brakes. You know, that can turn into a pretty good-sized build. But the thing you are asking about is uh, the bed. Now, with that, you can build, always build a stake bed or a flat bed. And then there's also a lot of pickup beds that you could put on there. You don't tell me how long the wheelbase is. This is a two-and-a-half-ton truck. That's a big truck. Personally, I would make a car hauler out of it or a ramp truck. That's really popular. And if you do it right, those bring some pretty good money when you go to sell them because everybody wants to carry their cool stuff with a cool ramp truck. So if the wheelbase is compatible with that, and you'll need about a... Uh, about a 12 to 15 foot wheelbase, you know, to where you can get that bed and that dovetail out the back, you know, because you'll want at least a 20 foot long ramp on that thing, depending on what kind of vehicles you're going to carry. And, and there's some companies out there like Jerdan that have actual aluminum beds, tilt beds that you can put on there and just have it, a, just build yourself a recovery vehicle. Uh, that would be really cool. There are some pickups that you can get. You know, you've seen guys put pickup beds on these bigger trucks. It looks pretty good, provided the wheelbase is right. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, I'm sure that probably wondering what you can buy, and that would be I would send you to a salvage yard that specializes in trucks because buying some of these used truck beds uh, are usually pretty affordable. That's where I would go on that. As far as your restoration of it, you know, that's... That's going to be up to you and how you plan on using it. 
But it's a cool truck. It's a great looking body style. So good luck to you, man. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Make sure that you check out the uh, Gears TV website. We got all kinds of cool stuff there. We got a couple new diecasts coming out. Got some books coming out. Uh, we have all kinds of things going on. But the most important thing is get out there and turn some wrenches yourself. Get a project. If you don't have one, start working on it. And if you don't have tools, check out Cornwell. They can help you out there. Also, don't forget to check out Gears on Gears Nation. Amazon, Mav TV, and Motor Trend. All right, we'll see you down the road.